All right, so take your notes out. We're going to dig into, I, I was thinking about this a whole idea that here we are 11 uh, days away uh, from Thanksgiving. And uh, Thanksgiving is this one time, this one space every year where we are in some measure, and, and don't, I hope this doesn't offend anybody, where we, we, are, we are in some measure forced to uh, manufacture gratitude around this one time of the year, hence the Publix commercial I wanted to show. Years ago, my father was the, the representative for the Nabisco account for Publix. So uh, there were years whenever you went into Publix and you saw Nabisco crackers, my dad was really a part of that. And so uh, Publix is, you know, they, they do these commercials and we're, we're forced to sort of manufacture this sense of gratitude. And yet sometimes when I look around, I don't know that I often see a lot of gratitude right now. Am I the only one who feels that way? There's not a lot of, gra- seeming like a lot of gratitude out there. And here is this one day. So I thought it would be a good idea to explore the subject of thanksgiving. Is that okay? And, and even this, I thought, you know what, even beyond just exploring thanksgiving, I thought, let's talk about gratitude but in all this thinking about gratitude, it made me start thinking about thinking and what it is that we think about whenever we think. That was good. I worked on that all week long. All right. And whatever it is that we think about when we think and why our thinking is so important to who we are and who God is calling us to be. And in all my thinking, I thought about this verse. I'm glad I'm through with that. Okay. And in Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, Paul says a very interesting little concept that I want to unpack for us. And in Philippians 4, verses 8 and 9, listen to what he says here. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever, uh, 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 if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. And whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. And so I thought it would be interesting to talk about gratitude, yes. But to also talk about our thoughts. Okay? So let's pray together. God, would you use this space in important ways uh, to say some things about our lives? I I think all of us, God, would uh, aspire uh, as we head into, you know, this season of gratitude that it might not be something, Lord, that we feel ill-equipped to manufacture or to produce, but rather, oh God, that we would live the kind of lives that overflow with gratitude. And if folks are like me, my sense would be some of us need to work on that, and so we want to talk about it, and we ask your blessing on our time. In the name of Christ, and everyone said, amen. Now, it's always a good thing to say uh, Paul is in prison. He's always in prison. He's in house arrest in Rome, scholars think, and he's writing a letter to the churches in Philippi to thank a friend who had sent him money. And within the letter, he lays down this track of what it means to be in Christ. And the letter is really, if you read the book of Philippians, which I commend to you, be a great book to read in this month, it, it's really a defense in so many ways. It's, it's, it's an ex- exploration into what genuine gratitude looks like. And Paul is painting like a, with an artist's brush and this beautiful portrait of things like contentment and joy and how these things don't really have to rely on our external circumstances. They come from within us. And so this is an interesting thing for us to think about, and and, uh, I thought it would be a good idea because we're going to move into gratitude. We're going to talk about that yet, but what if we were to sort of enlarge the conversation, talk about a few more things beyond that? And so I was uh, really thinking about this concept, and uh, I thought about this uh, idea And where Paul uses this phrase, he says, finally. 
So he's saying all these things, and whenever you see a word like that in, in the Bible, and you can write this down maybe to remember this, whenever he, uh, the writers, biblical writers would use a word like finally, finally, that's always to be seen as connective tissue for whatever immediately precedes it. And so if you're looking at that, and Paul says, finally, we go back a little bit, and we look at what immediately precedes it, and here's what immediately precedes it. He says this, rejoice in the Lord always. Isn't that interesting? So here is writing from prison, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. He says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and guard your minds in Christ Jesus. And then he says what we've just read, finally, brothers and sisters. And, and I think this is an important concept because I was reading recently about our thoughts. I don't know if you know this. Uh, those who research this thing say that we think between 12,000 and 60,000 thoughts a day. Some researchers conclude, this is interesting, that close to 98% of our thoughts across a day are much the same thoughts that we had for hours previous. And that of that 90% that we think again from the previous day, watch this, 80% of those are often negative. Interesting, isn't it? And so Paul is writing, and he's saying some interesting things, and uh, he gives us this idea. He says, finally, here's the connective tissue. And from that, I, I want to begin to lay sort of a track, which is where I want to take us over these next three weeks, and I want to give us really three strong ideas that Paul is saying that I think are important for us. And when he connects this idea, he says this word, finally, here's what he says, and I want you to write this down. He is saying this, number one, that we should let our thoughts begin and end with God. In other words, we should all be aspiring to move uh, into our space, into our mind, into our heart, this idea that we have this God in heaven who is there, who is for us. I remember when I was growing up, uh, and uh, I'm the middle of three sons, some of you have heard me say that before, and, and my dad had a special way every, every time he was going to transfer some responsibilities from one son down to the next son. He always used it almost like it was a rite of passage. And I can remember the specific time when my older brother was released from yard work and I was instituted into the yard work schedule. And my dad literally walked me out to the garage like I didn't know this and he showed me the lawnmower and this is what he said. He said, son, this is a lawnmower. I'll never forget that. And my dad taught me uh, you know, how to put gas in the mower, how to keep my hands from uh, going under the mower, how to put the catcher on the mower, and how to do this. And then the first few times he, he was releasing me to mow, he would, he would literally go out and he would mow the edges of the yard. And he would, he would get through with all of the lines and then he would say, keep it between the lines. <laughs> right? It reminds me of the story some of you have heard of the little girl whose mother walked her out to the front of the house. You probably heard this. And and she said, there's the driveway over here on the right. Here's a tree on the left. She said, you can ride your little bicycle from the, the driveway over here into the tree over here and this sort of thing. And that's where you're to stay. If you go outside the lines, you're going to get in trouble. And the little girl looked back at her mom and said, you might as well spank me now. I got places to go. <laughs> Crazy. And so my dad would go, here are the lines. Stay within the lines. What Paul is actually saying in this moment is he's saying that all of us who are aspiring to love God, all of us who are in spaces like this, who are carving out space to know God's will, to accept God's commands and his uh, wishes into our lives, we should create a space in our lives where we have this understanding that, of, that there is a God in heaven who loves us, who cares for us, and that we should never let our thoughts wander too far beyond that space. And I want to tell you, living in a culture that we live in right now, it's easy to do. Easy to let them wander beyond where they should. 
One of the things I love about what Paul, I think, is really communicating sort of uh, in this moment uh, is that, that this is sort of a, 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 an idea where he's talking about, you may want to write this down, he's talking about God's sovereignty. Let your thoughts begin and end with God. You know, he's saying, you know, this whole idea of, of this God who loves us. Don't, don't, don't be fearful. The Lord is near in everything. You know, say your prayers. Continue to have this faith. And the God of peace will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. One little phrase I, that I use sometimes in my own life that helps me uh, in this is just this. And maybe this would be helpful to you. It's a little phrase where I say this sometimes. The Lord is near. The Lord loves me. The Lord wants to help me. Why don't we all just say that? Say it with me. Ready? Go. The Lord is here. The Lord loves me. The Lord wants to help me. Say it again. The Lord is near. The Lord loves me. The Lord wants to help me. This is exactly what Paul is saying under this first point. He's really talking about God's sovereignty. He's saying this. We have a God who is here. We have a God who's right beside us. He's right there. We have a God who loves us unconditionally. We have a God who wants to help us. But this isn't all that he's saying. He's saying some other things too that I, I think are really important. We need to remember this. I remember years ago I read a story about a, a man who lost his wife in a tragic way. And they had one little son and uh, obviously in that space, it was a very difficult season in their life, and, and the son was having a difficult time sleeping at night, and, and, and finally, you know, after several nights of attempting to get the son to sleep in his own room, the dad welcomed him into his room because he just couldn't sleep. And he went to try to put him to bed that one night in, in his room and in his bed, father and son, and and the son said, Dad, it's even darker in here than it is in my own room. And he said, I know, but he said, God is in the darkness and he will be here to help us. And the son, the story goes, could never go fully to sleep at night until he knew his dad was there. And then he asked his dad the question. He said, before we go to bed, he said, Dad, in the darkness, is your face turned toward me? And when the dad said, yes, son, my face is turned toward you, he said, now I can sleep. It reminds me of what the psalmist said in Psalm 139. I think David's trying to get at it. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light will become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The dark will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. So Paul is saying, he's saying, first of all, right, that we would begin and end our thoughts with God. But then he says this, if you're taking notes, he, I, I think he's really, he, he moves on and he uses the word whatever. And that's the, that's the bridge between that last part, right? He says, finally, that takes us to the connective tissue at the beginning. And then he says, finally, whatever. And he uses this word, whatever, which is a, a, a word that is really important. And then he goes to the verse that I want us to look at. And he says, finally, whatever. And he says, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy. Think about such things. And what Paul is inviting us to do in that space is that we should aim, I believe, at higher and better thoughts. He's saying, really, I, I believe with all my heart, really what, what Paul is wanting us to do is wanting, he's wanting us to aim at higher and better thoughts. Just take it up a few notches. Higher and better thoughts about God. Higher and better thoughts about other people. Higher and better thoughts about yourself. 
Paul is saying, elevate your thought life to a different space. I remember years ago reading, I don't even know where I read it, someone said it this way, in the absence of information, we have two options. We can place mistrust, uh, suspicion, or we can place trust. We have a choice. And Paul is advocating that if we think higher and better thoughts, we are going to put trust in the space where we don't exactly yet have all the information. Boy, is that not a message for our culture. I mean, come on. We should think higher and better thoughts. I don't know. I'm, I'm challenged by the idea that over 90% of the thoughts we think are the same ones that we thought about yesterday, and over 80% of those thoughts are negative. I don't know about you. That challenges me. And I think Paul is really inviting us in this space to think some different thoughts. And, uh, you know, our negativity a lot of times, I think it sits on us like, it just sticks to us like lint. Wouldn't you agree? Right? And we just need to get one of those roller things and like roll it off of us. I, I was reading somewhere that um, you, it takes 21 days to create a new habit. Isn't that interesting? 21 days to create a new habit. And I was reading about a guy who was, who was uh, trying to challenge people to, to be non-complainers. And he gave out these little bracelets that people would wear. And every time they complained, they had to move the bracelet to the other wrist. And if they complained, they had to go back to the other wrist. And he said the goal of that was to try to get to 21 days without moving the bracelet from one wrist to the other. Pretty, pretty interesting. Paul is saying that not only should we... Uh, Remember to let our thoughts begin and end with God, but we should also aim at higher and better thoughts. And this is why I think he's saying this, and this is important. It's because our thoughts determine who we become. Did you know that? Your thoughts determine who you become. So in one sense, we could look at this and go, is this ju just, Pastor Dale, is this just the power of positive thinking? I want to go, no, it's not that. It's something way broader, way deeper than this. And Paul's saying, we should all be careful because our thoughts in so many ways are going to determine exactly who it is we become. I remember reading years ago from the book, Letters from a Skeptic. We have a class, uh, we offer a uh, a course and an experience in our church led by uh, Dr. Vic and Kathy Copan, uh, Letters from a Skeptic class, and it really helps people navigate intellectual barriers to faith. And uh, Greg Boyd, who's a pastor and a theologian, just quite honestly a brilliant man, uh, writes about uh, an experience that he had, a story that he remembers about a woman uh, who became this angry, bitter, ugly person and the reason when he began to understand her story, the reason this happened was uh, several days before she was to get married, her fian fiancé ran off with a sister and married her. And you can imagine the tragedy of that experience. And we don't know all of the ramifications and the ins and outs of actually what was going on, but the, the, the part of the story we're told is this happened. And this woman who uh, had this visited upon her, refused for over 50 years to ever forgive the people who had wronged her in this way. And Greg Boyd writes about that in this, this experience, and this is what he says. I have found, he writes, that we tend to become the decisions we make. The more we choose something, the more we become, listen to this, what we choose. We are all in the process of solidifying our identities and the decisions we make, which often begin internally with the thoughts that we have. It's as though with each decision we make, we pick up momentum in the decision that becomes ultimately who we are. I remember reading one time someone said this, so a thought reap an act. So an act, reap a habit. So a habit, reap a character. So a character, reap 
a destiny. See, this is important. And I, I really thought, you know, this would be a great time this season not to just do what pastors sometimes do and let's, let's have a sermon about Thanksgiving, but let's, let's enlarge the conversation and have a series about our thoughts because they matter. We become who we are. It's interesting. I'll give you one other final note. When Paul is writing and he says, think upon these things, he uses the word, and if I say it correctly, the word legizomai, and it is translated oftentimes best rendered by a translation of meaning calculate. So Paul is saying, calculate your thoughts around what is true, not what is false. Around what is good, not what is bad. Around what is noble, not that what is less than. What is praiseworthy or honorable or worshipworthy, not what is base or immoral. Because our thoughts determine our destiny. Maybe this is why the psalmist put it this way, or the proverb writer put it this way. He said, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Lord, uh, we need to be reminded in this space how important really our, our thoughts are in terms of who you're calling us to be. My sense would be, God, that we have people who are here today or listening online and, and we're at a beginning place. We just, we just need to carve out some space and draw a line down the fences and say, I'm going to keep my thoughts just within this space. Some of us need to be reminded that you're near, that you love us, that you want to help us, that we've heard all these other things about you, but, but God, your word says that you're you're near and you love us and you want to help us. Some of us, oh God, know deep in our heart we need some work on our thought life. We're thinking wrong things. And we have to be careful because we're building our lives on really what we think about. So in this space, oh God, would you begin to say some things to our heart as we use this space, this final worship space, to be reminded of your grace and your care for us. For we pray in the name of Jesus and everyone said, amen. Let's think about these things. We're gonna stand. We've got one more song we're gonna just sing and use this as a space to ask the Lord by the power of his spirit what we should all be thinking about in this season. Team. I wanna show you one other verse before I let you go. It's the last verse. Paul says, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. Now, I want to say this before I let you go. He's saying, you got to do this stuff. Uh, we can't just come in here and think nice thoughts and go out of here and forget them. So I want you to notice he's saying two things here, I believe. He's saying, put it into practice. But I want you to notice what he says before. He says, it's everything you see in me put into practice. Can you imagine living a kind of life that even in the difficult circumstances he was facing, he would say, hey, imitate me as I imitate Christ. I remember early in my ministry, somebody, I was standing next to my wife and they said, pastor, I'm just following you. And I remember the look on my wife's face going, I don't know about that, <laughs> you know, but that's quite a challenge. And he's making it to every one of us who calls ourselves a Christ follower. So go and do that. Help us, we pray. This is important. This is how you get your work done in us and in your world. For we pray in Jesus' name and everyone said, amen. Go in his peace. We'll see you next weekend.